So let's go ahead and get started. So today we're going to be continuing on with momentum. And just to remind you of some of the definitions and the equations that we laid out on Tuesday, momentum P, which is a vector, is defined to be the product of the mass of an object and the velocity of an object. So if an object is just stationary, it's sitting there, it's not moving, it has uh, no momentum. If it's moving with some velocity and it has some mass, the momentum is just the product of the mass and the velocity. Now, we saw that an object can acquire momentum if a force is applied to it by saying that the change in momentum, which is defined to be the impulse, which we give this uh, letter uh, capital I, is equal to the force that's applied to the object times the, uh, the time over which that force is applied. Now, in defining momentum and looking at situations where we're interested in uh, momentum, there were a couple of uh, different scenarios. And uh, these involve different types of collisions. So we had two types of collisions. The first type is what's called the elastic collision. And this only has one L, I believe. Um, I studied physics, not spelling, so I think this is the way you spell elastic collision. Um, in the elastic collision, both energy and momentum are conserved. So you can say that the initial energy is equal to the final energy. The initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. In the inelastic collision, Only momentum is conserved, so energy is not conserved. And so over the course of uh, today's class, what we're going to do is we're going to see examples of these different types of collisions and uh, how these equations can allow us to solve for um, some unknown quantity, such as what, what some final velocity is for one of the objects in a collision. Okay, so you see uh, over here, I already have uh, our first question, the question that we left off with uh, last time. <laughs> Uh, here. And so this uh, question says, consider two carts of mass M and 2M at rest on an air track. If you push the first cart for three seconds and the other uh, uh, for the same amount of time exerting an equal force on, force on each, the momentum of the light cart is blank the momentum of the heavy cart. So go ahead and talk about this one. So let's go ahead and talk about this one. So what did you, what did you guys come up with? What are you, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? One half. So we're thinking one half. Anybody else think one half? Yeah, some people think one half. Um, it's not one half. Sorry, it's not one half. It's not twice either. It's equal to. Why, why is it equal to? Yeah. Because we have different masses and the same forces apply. So you have to have like different velocities in order for your um, force and time to be both. Right, right. So th think about it like this. So we're applying the same force to two objects that have different masses. One's heavier than the other. One's got a larger mass uh, than the other. So the one that has a larger mass is going to have a smaller final velocity. And we know that the product of the mass and the velocity is what's giving us the momentum. So we have two objects, one that has a higher velocity, one that has a uh, uh, a larger mass. And so that, just looking at it like that, that doesn't really tell you exactly the scaling between those two things and, and which one wins out. But what will is the equation that defines impulse. So impulse is defined as the change in momentum, which is equal to the force times uh, the time. And this, this equation doesn't really care about what the velocity is or what the mass is. It just says the change in momentum is related to the force that you apply over the time. So you could have a very uh, 
uh, massive object or a very light object, but when you're looking at uh, how the momentum changes, it actually doesn't matter. It just matters that you're applying some force for some time. And because this force for the two objects is the same and the time over which you apply the force is the same, uh, the change in momentum is going to be the same. Okay? All right, so let's look at the next one. All right. So this one says, the brakes of your bicycle have failed and you must choose between slamming into a haystack or a concrete wall. Because haystacks and walls are equally likely uh, available options uh, to Cincinnati bikers. Uh, the haystack is obviously a better choice because, so think about why you'd rather uh, go into a haystack than a brick wall. Really difficult question to think about. Okay. So let's talk about this one. So somebody from like the middle over here, what do you guys think? What, what were some of the ideas that we came up with? What do you think? Why B? Well, the haystack is like a festival, so you apply your block to decrease over a longer period of time. Sure. You hit the wall and it decreased instantly. Perfect. Perfect. So the, the real difference between these two is the wall, you know, you, you hit it, there's no give, right? But the haystack has some give, and so because of that, the time over which it takes to stop you uh, is longer for the haystack than it is for the, uh, the wall. Now, what's the consequence of that? If the, if the time is longer for the haystack, what does that mean about another part of the equation here? What, is, what does somebody over here in the back think? Something about momentum? Yeah, it increases, it's like a longer time. Sure, sure. The, the time that, that the, the momentum is uh, changed over is longer for the haystack. But what can, what can we actually say about the change in momentum between these two cases? How can we compare those? They're the same, right? Because think about what's happening here. You have... You got your haystack. Actually, I found perfect haystack color here. So you got your, your haystack, okay? And you're going into the haystack with some initial velocity. You have some MV, and then afterwards you're inside the haystack. And then you're, you're here. And you're just, you're just kind of hanging out there, but you're not moving anymore, right? So here I have a, a velocity of zero. Here I had some uh, momentum of MV. So I can say that the change in momentum here is going to be the difference between the initial momentum and the final momentum, but we can think about what's happening with the brick wall. So with the brick wall, okay, you're still moving with some initial velocity, V, and then when you hit the wall, you stop. Or some people say you might die. Hopefully you don't, but you know, it's a possibility. So here, I have no velocity. So the change in momentum comparing this case to this case is the same. The difference is how long it takes to change your momentum. So here it's, it's really quick, right? Here you do it more gradually. So when we look at this equation and we ask ourselves, what, what changes in this, in this equation? Well, the, the time over which the, the force acts changes for the, uh, for the haystack. So what does that mean as a consequence if the left-hand side is going to be the same for both? Yeah, the force changes. The force changes. So if the force changes, or, or if the time changes, so if the time for the haystack goes up, what's gonna happen, have to happen to the force if these are both the same? The force has to go down. So that's really why you wanna jump in the haystack instead of hit the brick wall, because the force is smaller, okay? Good, good. So let's move on to the next one. Okay, so this one asks, uh, what are the units for momentum and impulse? So we have our equation written up here. Go ahead and uh, look at the equation and then uh, talk about this one, see if you can figure out what the units of momentum and impulse are. <laughs> Okay. 
So let's go ahead and talk about this one. So let's first start by figuring out what the units of momentum are. So we know that momentum is going to be equal to mass times velocity as a, as a scalar. And so the units of momentum are going to be equal to the mu units of mass times the units of velocity. So the units of mass are kilograms. The units of velocity are meters per second. And so momentum has units of kilograms times meters per second. Now, there's two ways that we could determine the uh, units of impulse. We could use either this left side here, so delta P is equal to I, or we can use F is equal to delta T. Now, the quick, quick way to do this is to say, well, I is uh, just delta P, and taking a difference of two quantities doesn't change the units of it, only taking a product or a, a quotient of uh, quantities changes the units. So this should have the same units as momentum. But we could also see this another way by evaluating what the units of impulse are explicitly from saying that the impulse is equal to the force times the change in time. And so if we do that, what we can say is I, or the units of I, are going to be the units of force times the units of a change in time. So this is a unit of a newton times a second, where a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared times a second. We can cancel our seconds, and we can see that this has units of kilograms meters per second. Okay, and so we see that these both have units of a kilogram meter per second. Okay, so let's look at the next one. All right, so in this question, it says, in the picture, Alex wants to give uh, the cart some velocity v to the right by tossing uh, some balls at it. And so he has these green balls and the, uh, the blue balls here. And uh, the blue ones will stick to the cart. The green ones will bounce back. If Alex wants to minimize the number of balls he needs to throw, which uh, should he pick? Uh, yeah, unfortunate choice of wording. I had a hard time reading that without smirking myself. But let's let's be adults and answer the question. So, uh, which one do we do we want to use in order to optimize the velocity that you can give this cart? Let's go ahead and talk about this one. So we have we have these two options. One where the uh, one one where we have the blue balls. One where we have the green balls. I'm I'm just gonna have to get through this. So so the blue ones are going to stick. The green ones are going to bounce. And the question is, which one of the two of these is going to cause the car to move faster? Okay. So let's consider uh, with a diagram what the difference is between these two. Okay. So you have. The, the green balls that are going to hit the cart, so this is going to come in with some velocity. We can call this some mass m1, some velocity v1, and this is going to have some mass m2. And when this hits, the green ones are going to bounce back, right? So this can have some, still some uh, mass m1, some velocity v2, and we'll say this is some, uh, actually I, I like this as a v3. So this is a v3, m2, v2, okay? This is just kind of diagramming what's, what's happening here. So this is the elastic case. Now in the inelastic case, this is going to come in, again, with some uh, mass m1, velocity v1, and then this is going to hit and it's going to stick, okay? So this is stuck here, and now this is going to move off with some velocity v2. And the, the question is, how can we optimize this velocity v2? Well, we can set up our conservation of momentum equations here, and then we can compare which one's going to have the larger velocity v2. So if I look at this as the 
The left side here is the initial state. The right side is the final state. The left side for this one, this is just going to be M1, V1. Same thing over here, M1, V1. The final state over here, if I'm saying that this is going to be the positive x direction, this is going to have an M2, V2 minus M1, V3. So since momentum is conserved in both of these cases, this M1, V1 is going to be equal to this M2, V2 minus M1, V3. And so we can say this is going to be equal to M1, V1. Now let's solve this for V2. So V2, or we can say M2, V2, is going to be equal to M1, V1 plus M1, V3. And so M, sorry, V2 is going to be equal to M1 over uh, M1 over M2 times V1 plus V3. Okay, so that's just the expression that we have for V2. We can do the same thing for this uh, second case. So for the second case, uh, the equation is a little bit easier. So we have this M1, V1. But now these two are going to move off together. So this is going to be M1, M2 times V2. So this is equal to M1 uh, plus M2 times V2. Again, solve for V2. V2 is going to be equal to uh, M1 divided by M1 plus M2 times V1. Now we can ask ourselves, for these two cases, which of these is going to be larger? Well, we know that uh, M1 over M1 plus M2 is going to be less than 1, right? Because this is, uh, say this is M1 is 1, 1 plus anything is going to be larger than 1. And so this is going to be some uh, number that's uh, less than 1. Um, so this velocity of the second one is going to be smaller. And we can, we can see that, well, maybe this one's going to be larger or smaller. It kind of depends. But let's say that both of these have the same mass. So if they have a unit mass that says that in the first case, in the case that I have here, this V2 is going to be equal to um, uh, half of uh, the velocity V1, whereas this one is going to be double. Okay, so you can kind of play around with the with the arithmetic and the algebra here, and then ask yourself, well, uh, what's going to happen in the various cases I have? And if I assume that these both have the same mass, we can see very explicitly that the elastic collision is uh, uh, better or gives you a larger uh, velocity than the uh, um, than the uh, inelastic case. Okay, so in spite of uh, Professor Shepard setting me up with a funny question, we managed to get through it. Any questions? Okay. So, so what? So that's a blue ball? So the, the green balls are better than the blue balls. Okay. No, nobody likes blue balls. Okay. <laughs> there it is. I, I had to say it at some point. Okay. Okay. So yeah. moving on. <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Never think that you're going to be able to say things like that in a physics class. Anyway, so uh, this question asks, in the following setup, a Galilean cannon, predict the height of the tennis ball. So basically what you're, what's going on here is you have a tennis ball uh, that's stacked on top of a basketball, and you drop them at the same time. And so you want to think about what's going to happen when, uh, when this hits the ground to the, uh, the tennis ball. So go ahead and uh, think about this, and I have a video to show you of it. Uh, in the last portion. Uh, so now we want to get into some, doing some actual calculations. And so this question is uh, based on impulse. And it asks, or it says, that uh, a one, or 0.144 kilogram baseball is moving towards home plate with a speed of 43 meters per second when it's bunted. Uh, if you don't know what bunted means, it's hit softly. Uh, the bat exerts an average force of 6.5 times 10 to the 3 newton 
spins on the ball for uh, 1.3 milliseconds. The average force is directed towards the pitcher. Uh, let the pitcher be the positive x direction. Use the uh, impulse momentum theorem to calculate the final speed of the ball. Uh, that is uh, this equation right here. Now, something you need to take into consideration, you have to be very careful about, is the fact that momentum is a vector. So the direction of the velocity is going to be important. And when you think about what's happening with, with baseball, pitcher throws the ball one way. And then when it's hit by the batter, in this case, when it's bunted, the ball changes direction. So it's going to have uh, momentum in the opposite direction in the second case. So go ahead and, and spend some time working on this one, and then we'll uh, talk about it. So let's go ahead and talk about this one. So this is a, a diagram of the situation that we have here. So on the top part, this is the initial state. And this is when, or this is right after the, the pitcher has thrown the ball to the batter. And uh, this ball is moving with some initial velocity VI. And then here's our final state after the ball has been hit by the pitcher, or sorry, hit by the batter matter and uh, it's moving in the opposite direction. Now when we're looking at this, the equation that we'd like to use is that the change in momentum is going to be equal to the force times the change in time. Okay. Now we could approach this one of two ways and it's really the same way, it's just a matter of what order we want to do this. And we have to evaluate both sides of this equation. So let's start with uh, the right hand side. And let's also do this just in one dimension because we're um, this is only in the x direction. There's no y components of anything. So when we look at the right hand side here, we can say that uh, the force is going to be the applied force that we have here, which is going to be this uh, 6.5 times 10 to the 3 uh, newtons. The time that we have is 1.3 uh, milliseconds, which is 1.3 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds. And when we multiply this together, we get something about 8.5. Um, this is going to be uh, newton seconds, I guess, right? So, that, that takes care of our right-hand side. But in order to evaluate the left-hand side, we have to be really careful. So. On the left hand side, we have PF minus PI, but take a look at the direction of these. PF, the momentum in, in the final state, is going to be the same direction as the axis that I've, this axis that I drew here, right? So that means it's gonna be positive. But when we look at the momentum in the initial state, this is going the opposite direction here. And so that means that momentum is going to be negative. And so, when we uh, want to manipulate this, we want to say that this quantity is ultimately going to be negative. So we can rearrange this and move this to the other side. So we have PF is going to be equal to 8.5 Newton seconds uh, plus PI. And because we want the velocity, uh, we can say that this PF is really going to be an MVF, or we can say this is VF. Uh, is going to be uh, the right hand side divided by the mass. And when we do that, and taking into consideration that this uh, needs to be negative, so this is going to be minus uh, mvi, we end up finding an answer of uh, 15 meters per second. So board work got a little messy there, but that's ultimately, ultimately what we have. But the key to this, again, is taking into consideration the fact that momentum is a vector. And when you define some coordinate system, you have to take into consideration is, is the object moving the same direction or the opposite direction as the coordinate system that we have. And that's, that's something that, it's a theme that comes up a lot, and we've seen it quite a few times before, that when we define some coordinate system, we want to know, is, is the, um, the displacement is going to be positive or is it going to be negative? Is the velocity positive or is it going to be negative? And you just have to be careful with the way that you're defining these things. Okay, so let's move on to another one. So... 
This one says, a bullet with mass of four grams and speed of 650 meters per second is fired at a block of wood with a mass of 0 0.095 kilograms. The block rests on a frictionless surface and is thin enough that the bullet passes um, completely through it without uh, shrapnel. What is the speed of the bullet when it exits the block? If the block moves in the same direction as the bullet with a speed of 23 meters per second, uh, compare the initial and final kinetic energies of the system. So once you have the, that velocity, explicitly calculate what these kinetic energies are and, and compare them. And then based on your answers to part B, what type of collision is this? Is it going to be elastic, inelastic, or perfectly inelastic? So go ahead and spend some time working on this one, and then we'll go ahead and talk about it. So let's go ahead and talk about this one, and then we'll move on to one more. So for this one, the first thing you want to do with these, with these kinds of problems is always to draw some picture showing you what's happening in the situation, because from that picture, you can build the equation that you need to solve. And so the picture that I drew here has the initial state uh, here, and we can put this in a box. We can say the initial state it's just the bullet moving to the right in my case. You could have drawn this you know, going whatever way you want, but I had going to the right. So that's your initial case. And the final case is after the bullet has passed through this, uh, this block here and the block began to move because the, the bullet goes through the block and there's some uh, friction between them. So that friction uh, is going to be some equal and opposite force internal, uh, internally when it's uh, moving through here. And what the friction is going to do is going to slow the bullet down. So the bullet's definitely not going to be going as fast as it was before. But because it, beca it forms this equal and opposite force pair, if the force of friction that the block acts on the bullet is going to slow it down, then the force of friction that the bullet is acting on the block is going to cause it to start moving. And so what that says then is you have the, the block moving to the right, kind of like, like you would expect, and then the bullet is also going to be moving to the right, but it's just going to have a smaller velocity. And so what I did was I denoted the block with some mass m2. Bullet still has the same mass m1, but now it has a different velocity. I'm calling this v3. I'm calling the uh, velocity of the block v2. Now. In order to uh, set up a, an equation to solve for what the final velocity of the bullet is, we want to apply conservation of momentum. And that's to say, and I make note of this in your notes because I, I, it's not that it was written explicitly wrong, but it, it was missing a piece. And that's to say the sum of the momentum in the initial state is equal to the sum of the momentum in the final state. So we can ask ourselves, what, well, what is the sum of the momentum in the initial state? It's only the momentum of the bullet here. So this is just going to be m1 v1. And this is going to be equal to the sum of the momentum in the final state. Well, in the final state, we have two objects that are moving now. And so this says then that this is going to be m2 v2 plus m1 v3. Now, we know what all of the masses are, and we know what the initial velocity is and what the final Final velocity is right. We were trying to solve for the final final velocity of uh, the bullet after it after it goes out. So we know we know this velocity and this velocity. We know what the masses are, and what we need to do is we need to solve for this velocity here. So what I can do is I can move this m2 v2 to this side. This is going to be m1 v1 minus m2 v2 is going to be equal to m1 v3. Divide both sides by m1 to find what v3 is. So this is divided by m1. And when we do that, we end up seeing that we get an answer for this, saying that our bullet has some velocity of 103.7 meters per second, when we plug in our numbers here. 103.7 meters per second. Now, this is a good time to pause and check our answer to see if it's consistent with some expectations that we have. And so, one thing that we know is that this velocity should be smaller than this velocity. 
velocity, right? So let's check it and see if that makes sense. Well, we started with a bullet, the bullet had a velocity of 650 meters per second. So this velocity is smaller than the initial velocity. And that doesn't necessarily guarantee that the answer is right. But you, you, don't, you know that you're definitely wrong if this is like 700 meters per second. And you started with this being uh, 650 meters per second. So that, that definitely wouldn't happen, okay? So then the next part asks to compare the initial and final kinetic energies of the system. So that's to say we can calculate what the initial kinetic energy is. This is just, so K initial is just going to be equal to 1 half M1 V1 squared, right? Because that's the only thing that's moving in the initial state. The final kinetic energy is going to have two terms. So this is going to be 1 half times uh, M1 V3 squared plus 1 half M2 V2 squared, okay? So we have our initial kinetic energy and our final kinetic energy. Now, if you evaluate this, what you end up finding is that Ki is going to be greater than Kf. And the reason for this is there's, there's some work done by some non-conservative force here. And that non-conservative force is the friction inside the block that's slowing this down as it passes through it. So we, we know that friction is a non-conservative force. So if we have uh, a non-conservative force acting in a system, then energy is not conserved here. Uh, so because energy is not conserved, we know that this, uh, for part C, it's not an elastic collision. Because in elastic collisions, we know that energy is conserved. So we know it's not an elastic collision. And then we, we can say, well, it's, it's some type of inelastic collision. But the question is, is it going to be just a, a regular elastic collision, inelastic collision, or is it going to be perfectly inelastic? And then we can remember that the, the condition for something to be perfectly elastic is that the two objects are going to stick. So if this bullet embedded itself in the block and then the two moved off together, then that would be a perfectly inelastic collision. But because this bullet passes through uh, the block, that means it's just an inelastic collision. Okay. So let's move on to the next one. So the next one builds off of these ideas a little bit and it also incorporates some conservation of energy. So this is what's called a ballistic pendulum. So this one says a ballistic pendulum is uh, often used to measure the speed of a rapidly moving object such as a bullet. If a bullet were shot straight up, uh, you could watch uh, how far it rises uh, easily to get this information using kinematics, although that would actually be something that would be very difficult to measure uh, because you, know, you have to know how high the, the bullet would go. But the ballistic pendulum makes it simpler because you can kind of do this on a, on a tabletop in some sense. Uh, so, yeah, they actually said exactly what I just said. So, uh, this says if you have a 7-gram uh, bullet that's fired into a ballistic pendulum whose bob has a mass of 0.95 kilograms, uh, the bob rises to a height of 22 centimeters. What is the initial speed of the bullet? So, like I said, the, the important thing to take in consideration here, you have to think about what type of collision this is. Um, momentum will be conserved regardless, but the type of collision will, will matter. And then you might have something you can do with conservation of energy uh, with this one. So it's kind of a, a multi-part problem. So go ahead and uh, spend some time talking about that one, and then we'll reconvene to discuss it at the end class. That'll be it. So we have this situation here where we have this bullet that's being fired into the block, and then the block is going to rise to some height here of H, let's say. Okay. So this block, we can say, has some mass of capital M. The bullet has a mass of lowercase m. And so what we can do is we can label these states, call a state A, call a state B, call a state C. So between state B and state C, energy is going to be conserved. So what we can say is that the energy in state B is going to be equal to the energy in state C. Now, the energy in state B is going to be all kinetic energy, because this is when the bullet hits this, it's not lifted up by any amount here. And so this is going to be 1 half M plus capital M times V squared is going to be equal to the energy at the top. Well, this stops moving when it gets to the 
top and it just has potential energy. This is gravitational potential energy. So this is going to be m plus m times g h. So we can actually cancel our m's and ultimately what I want to do is I want to solve for what the velocity is here. So that says that this velocity, which we're calling vf in the diagram, is going to be equal to 2gh with a square root. Okay, So that's comparing uh, state B to state C, but we can also compare state A to state B. And because this is not a perfectly elastic collision, we can't say that energy is conserved, but we can say that momentum is conserved. And so that's to say that PA is equal to PB. So then we could ask, well, what is PA? Well, this moved with some velocity, or initial velocity, V0. Uh, and it's had some mass of m, so this is going to be mv0 is going to be equal to the composite mass, so the sum of the masses, uh, lowercase m plus capital M, times the final velocity, this is vf. And now what we're interested in is the initial velocity. We can divide both sides by m, and then take the final velocity we solve for here and plug it in here. This says this is going to be m plus capital M divided by lowercase m times the square root of 2gh. And when we plug in our numbers and get an answer, we end up seeing that this gives us 200 and 84 meters per second. Okay? So that's going to be it for today. Uh, we're going to continue on with this on Tuesday.